We have Carl Kraskoff uh, re- reporting with us here today, and I really appreciate your time, Carl. And he's got a special URL URL for us. So go over to aurorasinvestmentgroup.com slash REI Mastermind, and I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes, and you can follow along and, and, and connect with Carl and his team. But we're going to be talking about pursuing your passion, syndication, um, him doing some flipping. I mean, there's quite a bit of things here to cover today, but I really appreciate your time. But um, before we do, I'm going to hand it over to you, Carl, and kind of, you know, there's a kind of give you a quick introduction of yourself, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Carl Krauskopf. I live in uh, Seattle, Washington. I've gone from the southeast of Florida to Dallas, now landed up in Seattle. And at Aurora's Investment Group, now we are hyper-focused, laser-focused on uh, new developments on a buy-to-rent as well as a buy-to-sell strategy, which has been uh, working fantastically for us up here in the Northwest. We're also working on uh, some value-add apartments. Right now, we've got some down in Tucson, Arizona, but looking to expand more so into the uh, uh, continued expansion into the Sun Belt. I spent about 10 years in corporate strategy working as a business development and uh, uh, business development and corporate strategy individual, a director there, where at, towards the back end of that, that career, I started realizing uh, that you know, I was working for somebody else's dream. I was working to make somebody else uh, an exorbitant amount of money. And you know, where, where is my fair share? And so uh, you know, I started looking, started doing some research on some alternative income streams, investment opportunities, et cetera. And was turned on to to real estate, and uh, took me about six months of hardcore research, reading podcasts, anything and everything that I could get my hands on to understand. And uh, you know, from there, I built up a very very small rental portfolio. Started slowly with flipping homes, got into some big luxury flip home flips, uh, studs out remodels here in uh, Seattle area. And I quickly realized that scaling a flipping company was was going to be difficult and and tiresome. And so you know, I started looking at what was the next opportunity, and it really became uh, clear that multifamily, uh, both from a, a ground up as well as a value add perspective, were were the next steps for me. Uh, once I made that realization, it took me about six months to make a plan to exit my corporate job, and started this business, found a partner, started scaling up, made our first hire earlier this month, my partner and I. And now we're rocking and rolling and looking at acquiring a $30 million portfolio this year and growing to $2 billion over the course of the next 10 years. Wow. So, you know, I, I want to point out one thing that I that really struck me there uh, for a second is that you actually took about six months to make a plan in order to exit your day job. Can you talk a little bit about like that process and what you did there to make those plans? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of it was budgeting for daily living expenses. How are we going to? Uh, because in the flipping in the flipping business, typically you'll you know unless you've got an, a huge volume or if you've got an additional brokerage business, your revenue and your income is very truncated, and uh, you know you, you can go six months with with no income, and then all of a sudden you sell a home and you get you know. Two hundred thousand dollars, and then it's budgeting for, from there for the remain, remainder of the year. And so, uh, you know, we, my wife and I, uh, as well as my business partner, sat down and we tried to figure out, okay, well, what's this going to look like once I leave? Uh, uh, once I leave the job, uh, you know, we looked at all of our inventory in hand from a, a sale perspective. We looked at our rentals, how much we were getting from rental income, and how much we had in, in cost of living. And it was really just a uh, painting a clear picture of what it would look like to not have a, a consistent paycheck from my employer and go towards that flipping business and so uh, you know what what quickly also came came to mind was you know this the whole concept of syndication and and thankfully that happened at the first you know month or two of that planning process and understanding how building a business where we're able to raise investor capital where we're able to uh, build these bigger investment opportunities with others that would be able to help offset some of those additional costs and would actually be able to help me focus on ensuring that a plan can uh, come to fruition via whether it's some of those sponsorship fees or some of those additional um, rental income from some of the multifamily that we were looking to acquire. Sure. 
So, so you, you went from doing the flipping, the single family home flipping, and now to multifamily real estate investing in some of the information that I, I, I read about you, you even, there was something about townhouses. What, where yeah. did that fit in? Yeah. Is that so that's still part of your strategy today. Yes, exactly. So the townhome development is is really what I would consider some uh, the the front entry, the entry point from uh, the residential side, you know, true traditional single family into the multifamily side where we're building these multiple homes, multiple. Uh, you know, right now we've got a six unit that we're getting ready to list next um, in, in about two weeks now, where you know we're we're putting up these these six units. We are uh, we have the opportunity. We're end, we're going to end up selling these because the market conditions right now are incredibly hot from a residential sale perspective. Where you know we we've got a couple other on hand where we're actually considering and we're pushing for that build to rent strategy, where we know we'll be able to capture we'll be able to uh, finish the project at sixty anywhere from sixty to sixty five percent LTV from the cost base, uh, including land, holding costs, etc. Sure. Okay. So. Yeah, it it also sounds like you know you're you're not going to be able to hit these goals unless you're doing some sort of syndication. I mean, you're talking about billions of dollars in portfolio by within ten years. Talk right. about talk about that process. How did you approach that first syndication and and ongoing? Like, how has it been to manage it? Sure. Yeah. So the, the first off, the two billion number is absolutely uh, you know something that's ambitious and in a big pie in the sky number. But when you actually sit down, uh, you know, when I sat down with my partner and we started mapping out the next ten years, you know, from t- from uh, the twenty twenty two goal of thirty million dollar acquisition to getting to a two billion dollar asset under management company, you know, once we start looking at the annual growth, when we start factoring in employee hires, when we start factoring in actually building a business that can scale to that size, the numbers actually become. Far more realistic and far more uh, within reach than uh, you know if you were to just look at that number on paper. Um, and so right now, obviously the the build to sell is not going to help get us to that number, but the build to rent, which is again uh, we're we're pushing for that. We've got several projects in flight that we're we're that's plan A for those, and it's really building uh, that side of the business as well as you know, obviously some of the value add strategies, value add apartments. Class B, Class C type stuff, and so you know, to your point, you know, syndication getting to a two billion versus self-funded getting to a two billion. Sell on the self-funded side, getting to two billion, I, I, I would imagine that that would certainly take quite a bit longer than the ten years if we were truly going to be doing this from like a, a burr buy uh, buy rent rehab uh, strategy, where you know on the syndication, working with other investors, working with our investors. We're going to be able to. Uh, we're going to be able to get to that number because not only are we performing for our investors, we're getting those referrals. We're continuing to grow organically and inorganically um, outside of just our investors. Is is we know that we're going to be able to get to that number as we continue to perform and as we continue to grow from an internal employee standpoint as well as an investor standpoint. Sure. So. I, I keep what keeps catching my ear is that you keep talking about when it comes to your goal setting is writing it down and having these conversations with your partner. Uh, to be honest, I think that seems like it's it's something that's not done as frequently as it should. Like talk about the importance of of sitting down, especially with your partnership, putting things on paper and actually planning this out. I think a great example of that is taking your $2 billion goal and breaking it down in 10 year increments, right. um, it, it becomes mentally more achievable than you mentioned it being pie in the sky before, but right. when you break it out in over 10 years, it becomes far more realistic in your mind. Yeah. So uh, my partner, Chris Bowen, uh, love him that he is, he is the engine behind the machine. Uh, and uh, you know, when we originally started talking about some of those 10 year goals, we we first you know kind of backed up and what what's our one year goal what's our two year and it became almost aimless because without that long term vision uh, you know you can make up one two and three year goals and even then it it it's a little bit more difficult so um, we put down a number on paper and we started working together on uh, well you know is a is that a reasonable goal and there started to get this this creeping of fear in of like well what if we don't hit it we're not going to hit it because it's too big of a number. 
And so, you know, it was about an hour and a half session where we, we literally just sat down, like you said, pen to paper and started mapping out, you know, year one and expanding from there. Right. And it's, it's, you know, the importance of writing down a, not only short term goals, but long term. My sense is that the long term goals are critical. Right. So that way you know where your ship is going. I'm not a sailor, but, you know, if, if you know exactly, if you know which, which direction you want to go, you can make those small little course course corrections throughout the throughout your 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 your, your ship sailing, but you know if if you're only looking at the course corrections in and of in and of themselves and not focused on where you get, where you want to go as as a business, you're really going to end up somewhere that where you probably didn't want to be in the first place. Mm-hmm. No, that that makes a, a ton of sense. You know, I and and my listeners are probably getting tired of me mentioning it, but you know, uh, and I've said it time and time again. Until until you put it on paper, it it's just a dream. It, right. It's when you put it on paper that's when it becomes a target. And and, yeah. and unless you unless you go through this exercise, and then frankly, I mean, it sounds like you're in the right position. And you found the right partnership because if you don't have those conversations or yeah I'll even say uncomfortable conversations at the beginning you will have under uncomfortable conversations down the road road so yeah and those those uncomfortable conversations down the road uh, will, will typically turn out to, they'll typically uncover even more uncomfortable things that weren't originally brought up and so uh, you know I think the value in a partnership where you're truly transparent and you're vulnerable is you have the ability to grow, you have the ability to have those uncomfortable conversations as they come up. So that way you can either A, decide to work through them or B, decide to you know part ways earlier on in the process instead of getting too far down the road, following maybe your partner's, your partner, your partner's vision as opposed to you and your partner's vision. Um, you know, I think it's critical to have those conversations. And I think one thing you, you know, you mentioned, and I know you mentioned frequently is writing down goals. And, and that's something that, you know, as cliche as it may be, I write, I do every morning, right? I, I, I know uh, where I want to be in 10 years and five years. And I write those, I write those down, even though it's, even though I wrote it, wrote it down yesterday, even though I wrote it down three months ago, I'm going to write it again, because I know exactly where I want to be in 10, in 10 years. And uh, sure, things are going to come up, things are going to change. And, uh, you know, that may change our, our goal inevitably. But typically, my guess is that we're going to get to ten years, and we're going to say, "Why didn't we think even bigger?" Yeah, and it, it, do you find that it's important to to do that as well, so that when you're prioritizing the events for the day, if it's not yeah. heading towards your goals, you start to don't you start to question whether whether you should bother with that or hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think one of the most important things I've learned as you know a, a business owner and running a business is being able to to create a roadmap of priorities and then assigning value and assigning a, a true priority to certain business needs or certain issues and really staying true to those things and knowing that in the light of the the 10 year picture where everything stands right so um, i know like you said uh, i know as i'm going through the day uh, does this really matter is this going to get me to my uh, one year goal which will inevitably get me to my 10 year goal I can decide whether or not to prioritize it dele- or even delegate it. Right. No, that's, that's, uh, that's great. So when you were talking to this, to your, your partner, like, was this like a match made in heaven? Like you knew this was going to be the, the person you should partner with, with right away? Or how did you both uh, go through the process of making sure this was a good fit? Sure. That's a, that's a great, that's a great question. And so uh, Chris and I, uh, you know, we met in a, a little mastermind group a couple, uh, I want to say two or three years ago, where the the both of us were we were doing real estate work in our own vein. I was flipping homes. He was master of short term rentals, and uh, you know, the majority of the other groups were uh, members were just kind of learning the blocking and tackling. And you know, we we kind of took a mental note of that. Didn't really pursue anything that, at that point, but. A little bit more than a year ago, last January, uh, he uh, and I reconnected. Uh, uh, I forget what was the premise, but we, we decided, hey, uh, like you know, you do stuff, I do stuff. Can we put? Can we do a project together just to test the waters, test the partnership? 
we looked for about two months. We finally found a project where we could, uh, you know, we were both agreeable. We could both do it. It was a big studs out remodel, the biggest one I had done to date. And, uh, you know, what ended up happening is over the f- course of the first three weeks is uh, we started catching on uh, the fact that, you know, some of the, the things that I, that I disliked about business, he was passionate about and truly passionate. Things like you know hyper detailed project management, building out systems, holding contractors accountable, all this type of thing that you know in the business realm itself, I was not. It was not something that I, I truly enjoyed doing. Whereas again, he was passionate about it. So over the course of between three weeks and three months, you know, we we started developing this idea of like, well, can we can you can you, can we continue to do this? Is this something that we want to continue to do? And the resounding. Uh, um, we kept echoing of yes, like let's let's continue thinking about what we would want to do beyond just this flip, and it just expanded and snowballed from there. I had already got it, uh, raised and syndicated my first deal. He was interested in townhome developments. He was also an interested in doing more developments, uh, backyard cottages, single family homes, etc. And he had also done an apartment, which I wanted to learn more about from him. So over the course of between month three and six, we were like, yes, let's do another project. We pick, pick, picked up another one, really enjoyed it. We picked up another one. And uh, we over the course of that kind of nine month, 12 month process, we really said uh, and aligned with each other on a, this is where we want to go. This is the type of business that we want to build. This is how we are going to build the, this business. And this is how we are going to get to that 10 year goal. And so... Uh, you know, it was it was a it was a little bit of a uh, kind of step out or risk from the from the get go from the, the the first few steps, but you know, since then I I can really tell that you know both Chris and I work incredibly well together. That he's the yin to my yang, and it truly is it it's truly is a a business marriage, and it's fantastic. Yeah, well, I I can't stress that enough. It, it I don't think you're you found a, a good compromise there in the fact that you, you complement each other. Uh, a mm-hmm. lot of business partners, they kind of get into this and, and, uh, they, they have similar aspirations and they have similar skill sets. And then you find down the road that, uh, the partnership isn't working because something else was being neglected. Right. hundred percent. So, um, as you were working through this, and, you know, I also like that you, you kind of started off with a with a project together. Uh, right. That is a great way to kind of do a dry run, if you will, to make sure that this is a partnership you want to kind of do long term. Uh, it's a good way to do a little dating in advance, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And it was that, that's the that's exactly how we po- uh, positioned it is. Let's let's get in, let's get one done, uh, let's figure out if it if we work together as a partnership, as a business. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that we were, you know, pretty specific on is, uh, you know, to have a, a really, really clear direction of who does what, when and why and, and where. Now, there's always going to be the instance of, uh, you know, where somebody needs help and needs to, to uh, need some additional assistance and something that, you know, is really in their own lane. But from a day-to-day basis, you know, we know where, we, where each one is operating, and it's again, it's a beautiful relationship and a great business, great business model. Yeah. So you know, and you also may, mentioned uh, give everybody uh, doing some tasks that they're passionate about, um, and I th- I think that was I wanted to call that out because a lot of people they keep telling you to follow your passion, and you know, I you get a lot of the generic responses whether it's real estate investing or or whatever career they've chosen, mm-hmm. but but. I think it's important to call out uh, on this, on these smaller levels of, of things that you're kind of, like you said, she, he's passionate about project planning and holding people accountable and, and a few other things. Right. And those are, those are tasks that need to be done, but if you enjoy doing them, it's not a struggle. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, for for me, I remember being in college and seeing the first position that I was starting to apply for, you know, get, getting out of college. And, uh, 
you know, it was a, you know, the position was irrelevant, but in, in this case, I saw what the position reported to, and it was a chief, a chief client officer, or, excuse me, a chief growth officer. And, you know, after reading the description of that, I knew exactly that growth, business development, building a business is, is, and was my passion. And so it's, you know, to your point, I think is real estate, it, you know, I think some of these things are maybe a little bit too high level to determine like it, that's not task based uh, passions, right? Figure out what it is in business or around business that you enjoy doing and capture that and then look for the things that, that you don't like doing. I knew exactly what I didn't like do, doing, right? It was the project management, it was actually managing the subs, managing the contractors as part of the flip business that I just, it wasn't the thing that I, I enjoyed. I woke up in the morning looking forward to do, to doing. And, and on the contrary, you know, he he worked in project management. He worked in marketing agencies in the past, and that so happened to be you know his particular passion. And so, you know, I think it was fate that aligned us, and uh, uh, it was taking us from here. Right. So, how many projects do you have going on right now? We are building currently 13 units. We've got uh, one other that we're, we uh, just dropped out of contract on. We were introduced a street improvement plan, which uh, blew the budget by about a million dollars. One thing that you know I would, I would advise from your listener's perspective to really be keen on is do the due diligence p- portion of either buying a property, going through the, the contract of, of purchasing a property, or even... Uh, you know, vetting your general partner and or your operator is really being able to to vet and do your due diligence on uh, who you're investing with and what you're investing in. And so, uh, you know, that that ha- that so happened to come up with us is you know this was a beautiful 26 unit build, uh, one of our biggest ones to date in uh, Seattle. It would have would have been our our next buy to rent. Fantastic opportunity. And we go under contract, and uh, our uh, we're we're given a street improvement plan uh, that was not part of the original document uh, construction documents. And uh, you know, we quickly scrambled, uh, went out, spent about two weeks getting bids from uh, half a dozen generals and a half a dozen sub- other subcontractors. And what ended up happening is it introduced about an, at least another million dollars of foreseeable expenses, which usually you know entails to be one and a quarter to one and a half million. So really taking the budget beyond where we were comfortable, uh, where we were comfortable seeking uh, capital from our investors. And so we ended up backing out. Uh, but the story there is, you know, making sure that you've got your time and you've got your ability to exercise due diligence on, again, what you're investing in. And for maybe some of the LPs, the limited partners who are investing in uh, some of these syndications is make sure you've got time to know, uh, like, and trust who you're investing in. Because you're not going to, you know, inevitably, investors aren't going to go through the full due diligence packet on a particular investment, right? Sorry, but it's not feasible to go through all of the title exemptions as a limited investor, to go through all of the survey, all of the construction documents. It's not what we found our investors do. Our investors are investing in uh, the entity that they're, that is making the investments. And so making sure that you know that your general partner, that your operator is going through, well, know exactly what they're doing from a a due diligence uh, standpoint. So at what point did you find out about the street improvement? Was that like- Two days uh, after contract. Oh, really? And uh, how did that get presented to you? Through the title company or? Uh, Further due diligence, further work with the architects and the title company, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's interesting. And should that have been disclosed to you at the time of of contract or part of the? Yeah, yeah. In my opinion, yes. I mean, it should have been. Uh, um, you know, typically there's there's always something that comes up in some of these construction documents, whether it's you know maybe an, an old bit building code where we have to go and and update it. I, I, I neglected to mention that you know when we were buying this property, it was a fully permitted project. So we didn't actually go through the permitting and the entitlements. We were buying a, a, a piece of land that had all of the entitlements and all of the permitting done on it. Sure. So, well, since you're buying existing properties as well, and we all know that the, the environment is very hot right now now and very competitive, 
Are you doing anything right now regarding your marketing or, or anything to, to stand out from the crowd? How has that been going? Yeah, it's a good question. So a lot of what we're doing is primarily, we're not going direct to seller at the, at the moment. We're really focused on our broker relationships right now, uh, building those with the, the national brokers as well as some of the regional, uh, regional bo- brokers in our target market. And so, uh, you know, we do a lot of things. We do monthly newsletters, which goes out to our investors. It goes out to our brokers. It goes out to any key stakeholders that we've worked with in the past, maybe fund to fund managers, et cetera. But we're also marketing directly to uh, our broker partners as well, keeping us at the, at the forefront of their mind. So that way, when they do get either word uh, of an off-market uh, listing or even a, a seller, you know, obviously these brokers are working with sellers frequently, and uh, you know, what when they get something, when they catch wind that a seller's interested in selling, maybe a uh, maybe a multifamily asset, that hey, every single week, you know, we're going to let them know that Aurora's Investment Group is buying. Here's our buying criteria, and here's what we're targeting, and so. You know, it's it's again marketing out to the brokers, as well as we're starting to find uh, value in marketing out to to lenders and architects, and some of the other channels where you know we could see business coming in uh, that's not through the traditional broker uh, broker channel. Sure. So, with with all that being said, let's let talk a little bit about like uh, one of the since you've started a partnership, what is one of the biggest uh, lessons that you've learned so far in the partnership itself. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say uh, it is to have those uncomfortable conversations. You know, at first we were kind of still trying to step step around each other. You know, not hurt each other's feelings, which we don't. Like we're, we're still very personal. Yeah, Chris is one of my best friends, and uh, you know, I would do everything uh, not to hurt his feelings, but. You know, at this point in the business, we know uh, we have to have those uncomfortable co- conversations, even if it does hurt some feelings. You know, there was an opportunity that I had uh, uh, that I wanted to pursue uh, sometime late last year, but you know, for whatever reason, uh, Chris didn't think it was a great idea. Which, you know, as as somebody who is trying to grow and drive the business from a, a, a business development standpoint, I was a little hurtful. But you know his his thoughtful approach around why it was very pragmatic was very diligent around why we you know why he felt otherwise and it made sense absolutely made sense so mm-hmm. we ended up not pursuing it but you know again going back to your question is being able to have those hard conversations knowing how and knowing when to have those conversations with your partner is absolutely critical and then g- give me an example of of a situation where you accomplished something together that you pro- you wouldn't have seen think was possible alone. Uh, that's a good question. So on our last syndication in I want to say October of last year, October 2020, where we uh, where we are buying and building a five unit townhome project in Ballard, which is a neighborhood of Seattle, uh, we raised I want to say eight hundred thousand, and we ended up having to turn down another three hundred thousand dollars of capital because we. In- uh, raised it's raised that eight hundred thousand uh, far quicker than we expected. Yeah, wow, that's 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 great to hear. Yeah. Well, you know, th- this has been a great conversation, and 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 I, I do kind of want to do uh, touch on one last thing uh, before we start closing things out. Is that you know you've accomplished a lot in in the last few years since you started this partnership, and there's usually an overwhelming reason as to why, like you, we talked about passion earlier. I I bring up time and time again, that most people will react to pain versus running towards pleasure. Sure. Like what, what was your, why, why did you jump into this to cause it to be such a driving force in your life? So, uh, I go back to, uh, I knew the piece of the business that I was unhappy with doing that. I knew that I wasn't a professional at doing which is that project management aspect, which is the follow through aspect as well. And so I knew that he was a professional at that. And when I saw that in him, uh, when I felt, you know, his passion, his, his uh, professionalism show as well on that side of the business as a key, uh, as a key operator, I knew uh, right then and there that there was strong potential in making this not only a good one-off partnership, 
but actually growing and expanding a full-fledged business um, uh, with him as well. So you probably saw a level of safety, or at least there was there was something there to propel you forward to to yeah. make you feel more comfortable. So Absolutely, I see. Sure. Well, this has been a great conversation. I want to point everybody over to aurorasinvestmentgroup.com/slash REI Mastermind. Uh, learn some more information from Carl and his team. But before I let you go, Carl, is there a question or a concept you wished I would have asked you here today? And I warned you, that's why I'm getting the smile from you now. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it would be, how is your operator communicating uh, bad news? Or how is, your commu- how is your operator syndicator manager communicating change in plans? I would say, uh, you know, along the lines of the due diligence, you know, obviously you, you want to make sure that your operator is is forthcoming, is transparent in the good times and in the bad times, or in just the times that are changing, which we all know times are <laughs> times are changing. And so, you know, from my my perspective, from our experience, you know, we we started our development in uh, one of the craziest times from a commodity um, commodity pricing uh, um, perspective, right? We we started a, a relatively decent, large size uh, development last year amidst the uh, lumber price spiking, which was not fair, not not easy to foresee and not easy to budget, right? How do you budget a thousand percent increase in lumber? And so, uh, you know, for me, communicating that back over to investors of, hey, uh, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. We built in a, a sizable contingency. We have sizable capital reserves. Um, and continuing the education and communication, I should say, on where the actual market is going from the appreciation standpoint, right? We we would have underwritten uh, the the exit value on these six units at somewhere about 3.5, 3.6 million. And over the course of the, the year, you know, even though our expenses increased by about a hundred thousand, our exit value, um, our exit value at this point is closer to about four, four point one million. So there is a bit of an offset, which is great. So I was thankful that I had good news to couple with that bad news. But again, it's how is your manager, how is your operator, how is your partner communicating bad news to you? So no, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time again, Carl. I'll make sure to have all those links in the show notes. Um, I hope you'll consider coming back again sometime. I'd love to. Thanks, Jack.